talking tonight and finishing out our series called uh, Becoming Immovable. You know, the reality is that things are going to come hit you. Whether you like it or not, storms are coming. There are things that are coming that's going to take the breath out of you. Have you ever had something like that happen to you where you, were un- you weren't expecting it? It was a diagnosis. It was a, a somebody told you something you weren't expecting. It was something that happened where you were not expecting it. And, and, and it took your breath away. I remember about, I would say, almost four, four and a half years ago, four years ago, I went through one of those experiences, and I w- had really obeyed God, and God had told me, I want you to go off staff. I want you to trust me. You're called to travel. You're called to preach. You're called to raise up women and that they would learn to live in the fullness of life in the midst of their life. And so the Lord said, I want you to trust me, and I want you to get off staff, and I want you just to begin to prepare. So at that moment, I did that. I remember going off staff, believing that that's what God was going to have me do. And at at the midst of it, having a baby and turning around at the end of having the baby and realizing that I was not, uh, things were not right with me. And I remember um, sitting at a pediatrician's office, and the doctor looked at me, and she said, how are you doing? I said, I'm just really, really struggling. And she said, that's funny. It seems like you're pretty capable. I can't imagine. It doesn't seem totally appropriate for what you have. She said, it sounds like you have postpartum. And when she said it, I, my eyes filled up with tears. I remember feeling this sense of overwhelmed, uh, uh, like somebody had read something you, you didn't even know was kind of happening. And when she said it, I, I remember tears streaming down my face. And I called up a friend immediately and went in and sought help immediately and met with a godly Christian counselor. And uh, we sat together and I talked to her about how what was going on. And she said, you know, of, of everything you're going through, you have postpartum depression with your baby. And I didn't feel disconnected from the baby. So I, I always thought it was like the person who didn't want to be around the baby. And I like to be around the baby. And so I didn't think it was me. But as we talked about it, I realized that I was going through severe depression. I was going through something that I didn't know was, I didn't know what to do. And, and so I sat in that office week after week and many times in tears. And I began to realize that I was at the place that I had come where I didn't expect to be at this place. And because I didn't expect it, I didn't have any tools to know what to do. There's nothing more helpless feeling than when you don't know what to do and you're stuck somewhere that you didn't know you were going to (laughs) be. You know? There's nothing worse than feeling like I didn't have the tools for this. I wasn't expecting this. And I remember going into that office and I went in that office for a year and a half and I sat and I talked and I decided I was going to do business with what was going on in my heart because I realized that my life had set myself up for depression. It wasn't just the baby. It was the, it, it was the climax of all that had happened in my life, a lack of boundaries, a lack of understanding, a lack of, of true identity in Christ and not knowing what to do and, and not realizing that, that, that life had set me up. I had, make, I had made agreements with things that weren't really biblical. I had made agreements that this was what made me purposeful. This is what made me valuable. This is what made me worthy. And as I went in to get into those areas, I realized that those things were shake, they were shakeable. That the things that I put, built my life upon was like a crumbling sand. And when the winds came, and like the story in the Bible, the house that, that was built upon the sand, when things came at me, the unexpected came at me. I crumbled, and I didn't know what to do. And tonight I want to talk to you about the reality that things are coming and they are going to take our breath away, but God wants to give us tools in the midst of those things that we would not be shaken. We will, we can, there's times when we can feel a shaking. There's nothing wrong with feeling something, but it doesn't knock the wood out of us to such a point that we stop believing and we stop knowing And so I believe the Lord wants to give you keys as well as myself to give you keys. I think about in the Bible, there was a people just like that. Think about the Israelites. And the Israelites were totally rescued out of Egypt, right? In Egypt, they were enslaved and, you know, they, they, were, they, were, they were making bricks out of nothing and they were, you know, being abused. And so they were rescued out of this place and they were into the desert and they had this, this man, Moses, who comes from this palace and then he decides to be their redeemer and he comes and he, he rescues them. And it's just this unbelievable epic story in the Bible how they get out of this, this whole slavery, 
And then they're in the wilderness, and they're wandering around with a man named Moses. And it's an entire, I mean, it's crazy. Could you imagine an entire, like, generation, an entire, you know, ethnicity of these people are wandering in the desert. And now they know they can't go back to Egypt because Egypt is in slavery. But in order to get to their promised land, they have to fight the giants. And here you have a people that are between a rock and a hard place. Have you ever been there before? I can't go back to that, but I know I don't know how to get there. I just kind of feel here. (laughs) You ever been there? And this is what these people are like. They're in the desert. They're wandering around. They know the only way they got to go into their promised land is to fight some serious giants that are bigger than them. Some guys come in, like we talked about this morning. They come and they give them some reports. And it says, listen, we're grasshoppers in these people's eyes. You better watch out. And the, the two men that stood up and said, we can do it. They're like, let's kill them. You know, there's just total craziness going on in the camp. And, and all of a sudden, here's these people called by the name of God. They did the right thing. They left slavery. They followed God. There's a pillar at night. There's a cloud by day. They're doing what God's asking them to do. But even in the midst of God's will, we get stuck in places that seem like a rock and a hard place. And many times I've found in my own life, I've gotten stuck in those places. And that is where the questions come. And that's where the shaking comes. And that's where the things we say, we don't always know if we believe it. You know, something about me where I got to the place in, in my depression where I didn't, I didn't know if it was really going to, if I was ever going to feel right again. You ever had that before? Am I ever going to feel right again? Am I ever going to feel, I remember there was some points when I would talk to the counselor and we would talk about this and I would, I would, she'd say, how are you doing? And I would say, it was, I finally, for the first time this week, had one of those moments where I felt like it was all going to be okay. And I hadn't felt that in so long that the moment I felt it, it was like, oh, it's going to be okay. And then it would leave me and I would, I would go on and do the things that were duties. And it felt like all I could do is get to bed and feed my kids and change some diapers and then go, go back to bed and, and then get, get up again and do the same thing over and over. And in the midst of it, I knew it wasn't sin that had led me there. It was circumstances. And sometimes the enemy likes to use the rock and the hard place to beat us up. You ever found that? The enemy likes to pick on you and say, see, look at, I knew you weren't doing it right. Look at, I knew what you, what you believed wasn't going to happen. See, look at that. You hope for this. Something is wrong. You're paying for your past. You ever had that before? You're paying for your past. This is why it's not working out. And the reality is is that God sometimes allows us to be in those places of transition so that we begin to know who we really trust in and what we really believe. And without that kind of shaking, we don't know really because in the high moments, we don't really know what we believe. It's like on your wedding day, if I was to say, do you believe in marriage? You'd be like, I believe in marriage. Take my picture, you know? That's what marriage is like, right? You get married, it's like, have you ever talked to a bride? They're like, it's gonna be fine. I remember going through marriage counseling and it was like this. What about this? Do you like this? Okay, great, awesome, yep. Yep, everything's great. Yep, we believe in everything. We go through things and they'd say, well, what about, you know, conflicts? And we go, we, we won't, you know, we're fine, you know. Well, do you believe in working out? Absolutely, we're working out, no big deal. And everything was like, yep, 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 everything's gonna be great. Everything's gonna be awesome, it's gonna be great. And then you get married and it's like, wow, you're still here. <laughs> Have you ever had... I'm still, you're still here. I remember literally taking my mail and just going in the bathroom because I just wanted privacy from everybody. It was just like, I want to read my mail by myself. I don't want to be asked if it's a bill. I don't want to be asked if it's for him. I just want to read my mail. And my husband's very, I mean, he's not pushy. I can't imagine being married to somebody who's pushy. I, I, I don't know. And um, <laughs> he's, he's gentle. But I, I just think about those realities like, oh, we believe, oh, but God, you're so awesome. It's a flourishing time. And then it's like, bam, the unexpected happens. And we go, oh, I don't know if I believe that anymore. I want to, but I don't know. And this is what becoming immovable is when we actually look at those areas and say, I'm not afraid to look at the things I don't know if I believe him for yet. But I'm willing to go there. And because I'm willing to go there, he's going to give me the answers I need. It may not be immediate, but it'll be the right thing. And God took me on a journey where I began to understand his character more than his actions. 
Does that make sense? I began to understand that his intentions towards me was good. No matter what was going on, I knew that it was all going to work out for the good of those that love him and are called according to his name. It's all going to work out. It may not be the perfect picture that I was hoping for, but it's the right picture. And it's exactly, it will bring him glory and it will help. It'll help me in the end. At the end of the day, it's an earth. We live on earth. Things are imperfect. It's just life. There's circumstances that hit us. There's nothing you can do about that. Everyone's going to leave the earth at one point, and unfortunately, people leave sooner than we'd want them to. Things happen that we can't help. It's just how life works. But in the midst of that, are we still going to look at the eyes of God and say, but I know you are good. I know you are just. I know that you are righteous. I know that you have my best interests. I know that you love me even in the midst of this, because you're never going to leave me and never forsake me in the midst. So the Israelites get stuck in between this, this really, really bad situation. Really bad. Doing the will of God, still stuck. But then God gives the Israelites a specific plan in battle. He shows them, this is what I want you to do in the midst of feeling like I don't know what to do. This is what he says. Exodus 14, 13. This is from the Amplified, so it's got a little bit of extra in there. It says, Moses told the people, fear not, stand still, firm, confident, and undismayed. How many of you know when shaking comes, it's very hard to be firm? It's hard to be, uh, 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 you know, not dismayed. We want to we wanna react. And he says, see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians you have seen today, shall, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. And you, here's our responsibility. He said, hey, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to fight for you. You notice this is his responsibility. I'm going to do this for you. But here's what I want you to do in the midst of it. I want you, you shall hold your peace and remain at rest. Doesn't that sound so easy? <laughs> it's not easy. You shall hold your peace when everything's crashing down. You shall hold your peace when you can't see what's in front of you. You shall hold your peace, hold your rest. Listen, grow, holding your peace is an exercised trait. Holding your rest, it, you're going to have to be really intentional about holding your rest, finding the place of peace and fighting for it. And some of that is that we get so anxious, we want to do something. Let me just call them up and tell them what I think, and let's resolve this. Let me just let me run over there. Let me get them. Let me shake them. Let me stop. I mean, how many of you have ever been in those situations with your kids or a spouse or a friend, and you want to make it, just let's stop this. But the reality is we don't have control over anybody. We can't do anything. We can't change them. We can't have them say, even if they said what you wanted them to say, you probably wouldn't like it anyway. You probably wouldn't like it anyway because you would be wondering if they were saying it for you and then you'd be on that whole trip already. And so there's a point when God says, I'm going to teach you women, I'm going to teach you men, that in the midst of the unshakable moments, number one, I'm going to fight for you, which means... That even if you can't see it, I want the very best for you. But also, I want to teach you how to be at rest and at peace. And when you meet people that, that know how to have peace and at rest in the midst of turmoil, isn't it a powerful thing? It's a powerful thing when you watch somebody not be shaken. When you go, how could you? I would, I would be so mad at God, I wouldn't be in here. I've seen, let me tell you, I've been around some people that have experienced some pretty cruddy things in life. And, and when I see them respond and worship and actually just try, I want to go, that is, uh, how did you do that? I would not. It's profound. It's a profound attribute to be able to respond at peace and remain. I like the thought, but many times I like what the Bible says, after having done all, stand. And sometimes we're really good at having done all. 
really good at having done all. I made all the phone calls. I wrote all the emails. I even did an anonymous Facebook post to let them know. You know, I, I've done everything I can. You know, I, I've, I've, I've yelled. I've screamed. I've cussed. You know, I've done everything I can. Come on. And that's, I'm not saying that's the right thing, but I'm just saying some of us in the room may have done that. We've done everything we can in our own human emotion and all this stuff. And God goes, silence your heart, honey. Silence your mind. Begin to lean upon me because there's a point where some of us have done all we can, all we, that's all we've ever done. And we go, I don't understand. This isn't working. Well, if it's not working and you're still trying to do the same thing, then that's just crazy. And so there's a point when we have to say, I need to really be good at just standing still. If you can, can learn to, can, to be okay with, not being, with things not being okay, you're going to do better. Just listen, please, hear this. If you can learn to be okay when someone else is not okay around you, and you control your anxiety at that moment, not to jump in, fix it, run, make it work. Just say, you know what? I am not in control of them. They can do whatever they want. I'm going to be responsible for what God's held me responsible for. You're going to live at rest. When, God, when you start to go in other people's environments and start to try to get them to change is when you get exhausted, burned out, and usually burnt. Usually you learn your lesson because you realize that even though you would like to hear that, they don't want to hear that. And even though that would shake you, that's not going to shake them. And so there's a point where we have to go, you know what? I've got to, having done all, and I'm talking about in a godly sense, I've prayed, I've cried out, I've sought you, God, I've asked the questions, I've pleaded, I've done everything, and now it's time for me to get back in the place of rest, it's time for me to stop figuring it out. How many of you, God, God just says, stop being so nosy. <laughs> stop being so controlling. You don't need to control this. I've got it under control. Just sit for a minute and learn to find rest. Because if you let your body, how many of you have found this? If you worry about something long enough, your body will finally shut down. How many of you just continually get sick? There are people tonight that signed up for the conference and paid $50 to be here, and they are not here. Why? Because the stress in their life is so compulsive to them that their body wears out continually. And they get to such a point where they are obsessing about something or something they have no control over, and it is wiping their strength away from them. And what God has for them, which is perfect peace and perfect rest and an ability to sit back and find that place of peace, they are still trying to be God. And the reason I know that is because I is one of them. <laughs> I have had sores in my, I mean, I have stressed out. I've been up at night. I've, I've worried. I mean, and then you realize you're the only one who's not sleeping. <laughs> they're, they're sound asleep. I mean, they're not that worried about it. They're not calling you. <laughs> they're not at church crying out for you. They're, they're doing fine. And then you realize, wait a minute, maybe I am more concerned about what's going on than they are. This is not healthy. And we have to say, Lord, I want to learn what it means to actually just stand. And there are certain points when I have to say, Lord, and I just feel the Holy Spirit say very clearly to me, just stop it. Knock it off. Stop it. You, can't, you cannot think this out. You cannot reason this out. You cannot work this out. You've got to just stop right now and say, I am not God. I don't know what to do, but at this moment, I'm going to look to you, God. And some of us, I know for me, i got to say it out loud. Is anybody like that? Because if I try to do war in my, in my mind, it, it's like I am like a, a split personality. It's like, la, 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 la. And so sometimes I will literally go in my house and I'll just say, I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to believe in you. You've got this covered. You can do this, God. I cannot, but you can. I don't know how you're going to figure it out. I don't know how you're going to turn it around. I don't know how you're going to make it beautiful. It seems like a pretty big mess to me. I'm feeling shaken right now. I'm feeling like I'm on a huge earthquake right now. But at this moment, I'm going to trust you, God. You got this covered. And when I begin to say it, when something about speaking it, the Bible says there is life and death and the power of the tongue. When we begin to declare something... All of a sudden, there's things that are broken where we cannot, listen, you cannot think bad thoughts and say good things at the same time. 
I, I want you to catch that. You, meaning you cannot, it's like, that's why when we worship tonight, it's important we open our mouths and sing. You go, well, why? why? I'm not a singer. I don't know harmony. I'm not, I'm not a good vocalist. I mean, why does everybody have to sing? There's something about when we open our mouths and we begin to say something, we hear ourselves saying it, or we're having to think about what we're saying, and it begins to get us direct to do what we're actually wanting to believe. And we talked about this this morning, but the enemy cannot read your mind. The enemy has no power. He cannot read your thoughts. He doesn't know what's going on in your mind. He doesn't know the battle that's going on in your mind. The only thing the enemy can do is hear your words. And so there are many times in my life where I am I'm really struggling in my mind, but I'm never going to let him know that. Why would I let him know? And so I begin to just say, I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to believe you. Did you hear that enemy? I'm going to trust him. I don't know how he's going to work it out, but I got a God that likes to work out hard things. He likes immovable things. He likes things that that seem overwhelming. That's the kind of God I serve. And I don't know how he's going to work it out, but he's going to work it out. He's going to work it out. And I just begin to say it. Sometimes when anxiety hits me and I just go, I'm not doing this. I'm going to praise until I have the peace. You see, God is fighting for you whether you feel it or not. God is fighting for you whether you feel it or not. Some of us trust our feelings to such a point that it rules us. And and sometimes feelings can give us insight into maybe something we're experiencing. But many times in the midst of a battle when we're really fighting it out, when things are really shaking us, we our feelings rise to the surface. It's the biggest thing that comes up. And, and we don't know what to believe. And our feelings feel so strong. And there's anger. And there's anxiety. And there's frustration. And there's, I don't know, resentment. And, you know, I don't know what to do with all this. And our feelings will rise to the surface. When our anxiety goes up, the first thing you're going to do is, feel that I don't know what to do and we want to respond and I will say this to you we have to go back to God's intention for us he is fighting for us on our behalf he loves us he made us he knows the way out of this he knows the way listen you are not too far whatever's gone on in your life you are not too far to get free the enemy will lie to you and say that you shouldn't have gotten there you shouldn't have done this well because of this your kids are this because of that your finances now it may take a ton of work there are things i've gotten myself into <laughs> that i go this i don't know wow this is rough and some of it's i'm having to eat humble pie because i've said things usually it's something i've said <laughs> i know it shocks you all like i'm sure but usually something i've said and it's in motion. And then I'm either going to have to fight it. And, and there's nothing worse than realizing you're wrong in the middle of an argument. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That, I mean, there are certain points when you just go, oh, no, <laughs> this is not happening. I'm wrong. Now, some of you are really good at this. You just fake it. Tell you, it's like, well, you go think about that. Right? Because it's like, you know you're wrong, and so I don't want to admit it. I have nothing else to say because I know you're right. So you think about that. I'm going to walk away because I'm angry. And then you just kind of panic and go, I just hope he gets something out of that. (laughs) I've done that many times being pregnant primarily. I I have an emotion that just rises up for a moment. And then after that, I realize, "Uh uh-oh. But there's nothing like that when we realize that that something is, we got to understand he is fighting for us in the midst of it. His intentions towards us are good. And I, I love this. Uh, I love this. I want to talk back about Ephesians 6.13. It's having done all you can stand in the midst of that. I love this verse. It says, therefore, put on God's complete armor that you may be able to resist and stand your guard in the day, evil day of danger. Now, we are in the evil day of danger, which means there's a lot of evil in the world. There's a lot of darkness in the world. There's things, people are still getting hurt and abused, and there's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of broken people that are breaking other people, and there's a lot going on. He says, but to protect yourself in the midst of that moment, having done all the crisis demands. I love how the Amplified puts that. Having done all the crisis demands. Nothing more, nothing less than what's expected. And this is where we blow it when we, we want to be moved. Some of us don't do enough. 
We just don't. We don't, we don't want to get involved. We're tired. We're worn out. We're lazy. We're apathetic. You know, we just go, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to even get involved. And God's going, I want you to rise up and fight for this. I want you to rise up. You can do this. You may have to show up like a grown-up, but you're gonna, you can do this. Then there's some of us, we do way more than the crisis demands. You know, we're in people's yards. We're, ta- we're making decisions for people. We're, and all of a sudden, we have to realize, God, what is in this midst of my crisis? What are you asking me to do? And we go, well, I should do this. No, no, wait, wait. Is that you saying that, or is that someone who said that to me? Wait, wait, let me get back. What do you want me to do? And God says, I want you to trust me. I want you to lean on me. I want you to believe me. I want you to read my word. I want you to say good things over yourself. Have the power of life and death in your tongue. I want you to say, and then I want you just to sit and wait. Because I'm about to do something. You see, I'm about to give you your promised land in the midst of this crisis. But you're never going to be able to fight the things around you unless you start small and learn. And then we look at Second Chronicles 20.15. It says, he says, hearken all, all Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, the king of Jehoshaphat. The Lord, says, the Lord says this to you. Do not be afraid or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but it's God's. See, I, I've come to believe that you can be in a battle and still enjoy your life. Some of us think that when we're in the midst of great disappointment, tragedy, or whatever, or something's coming at us, that we have to mourn, and we do mourn, and I get that, but there's part of it where if every time something comes against me and I go into mourning, I'm never going to enjoy my life. Because the longer I've learned in life, people are always going to be mean. I hate to say that, but things are going to come at us. Things are not going to work out. There's always going to be hard, things that aren't going to pan out like we hoped. And so if I'm always going through this process of I can't enjoy my life right now until it works out, guess what the enemy is going to want you to do? He's going to want you to be in crisis for the rest of your life. He's going to want to stick you in crisis so you never enjoy your life. You're in this battle, and pretty soon, why not give up? If I can't enjoy my life, let's just <laughs> let's stop the merry-go-round. And let's go do something. Let's just medicate until we leave the earth. Because that's too hard. And I just believe there are things in my life I've learned that I'm going to enjoy my life. And part of that is learning what I'm responsible for and what I'm not. And being appropriate to those things in such a way that I know, you know, it's, this is what you're looking at, God. And that's it. And that's it. And it keeps me safe. If you're in a moment where you have been shaken and, and you're such to a point that you feel like the wind has been knocked out of you, that's okay. It's okay to feel like that, and it's okay to experience that. You're human. These things happen. The unthinkables happen to us. But at that moment, I want you to know that God is still fighting for you, and he's still fighting for your heart, and he wants to teach you in the midst of this that you can still enjoy your life, and he wants to lead you out of the darkness, out of the valley of the shadow of death, along streams of living water to refresh your soul, and you don't need anybody else to help you do that. God can lead you to that place and refresh your soul. I know that because I have felt darkness in my soul. I know what it's like to feel so depressed. I closed every blind in my house, and I prayed to God no one would stop by because I knew I didn't want to face anybody. And I remember saying, Lord, you got to show me a way out of this because I cannot adopt my children out at this point. That's not going to be healthy for anybody. (laughs) And I I can't stop what I'm doing. Bills are still going to come. People are still going to expect things. I can't check out a life. I'm going to need some help right now. And the Lord says, I'm going to teach you at this moment how to enjoy your life without anybody recognizing you, without anybody pulling you out of it, I am strong enough because when my heart is overwhelmed, the Bible says, he leads me to a rock that is higher than I, and he pulls us up, and he puts us on that rock, and he says, you can do this, sweetheart. I know your heart is overwhelmed. I'm going to teach you how to get to me. I want to talk about necessary attitudes of success in being steadfast. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. You don't have to turn there, but I, I I want to stay on this for a minute. 
It says, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and immovable. I want you to write those two words down in your, in your books if you have them or, you know, on your hand if you don't have anything else. I want you to write this, the words steadfast and immovable. These are very key words to this passage, and it's very key to what we're going to talk about tonight or what we're talking about. When you look at the word steadfast, the original meaning goes as simple as this. It means stationary. Something as something that, something such as something that sits in one place for a long time. Being steadfast. Now, when I thought about this, I looked at, I thought about a treadmill, okay? I'm going to do some running. Have you guys ever seen a woman pregnant with heels running on a treadmill? It's going to, it's going to blow your minds tonight. No, I'm kidding. I'm not going to put this on. I'm a little scared. I admit it. I'm a little scared of what's about to happen. I have some friends in the room that are nurses, and they can help me. I understand that. But um, I'm not really ready to go into labor. So I think about a treadmill. And many times we've used this analogy like, oh, you know, you're in life and you're stuck. Or, but I, I want to take it in a whole different level. I want you to think about this. In life, there are things that we're going to do that seem like we're going nowhere. But you know what you're doing? You're being steady. And you're going to feel like, what am I doing? But you are walking this treadmill. You see, you can be fruitful and steady at the same time. You can be fruitful and not busy at the same time. You're steady. You're doing the same thing God asked you to do every day. Every day you're doing the exact same thing and you're walking this thing and you're being as steady as you can be in the midst of what he's asked you to. And many times we get off the treadmill, we want to do some running. We want to like run around and leave this place. But God's saying, will you just stay here right now and just do the exact thing I asked you to do? Some of us don't like what God asked us to do and so we're running around doing things that he never asked us to do because we don't want to go back to what he asked us to do. Someone goes, well, what are you, you know, what, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing the last thing God asked me to do. And you know what? What God told me to do, the last thing, was probably about a year ago. You go, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Listen, the longer you are with Christ, he just, re- he refreshes your heart and says, remember, this is what I want you to do. And you, spiritual maturity is doing the thing that God told you to do last time. And doing it well. And doing it over. And doing it with all your might and all your heart and all your soul. And you do it as long as you can until God interrupts this program to change the next direction. That is what it looks like. And some of us, you know, I remember I felt this way. It was like, okay, God goes, love your boys. And I go, okay, I can love my boys. I did bedtime routine. I did bath. That's great. Now what, God? And God goes, do the same thing tomorrow. And I'm like, that is demonic. That is not powerful. That's not a powerful life. Bath time is great, but it is not like powerful. You know, making dinner doesn't feel great. It feels great for about a week. You know, make it a good dinner. But then after a while, it's like, can you cook for yourself? Somebody, get some food. Not, and most of what you're going to do in life isn't going to feel spiritual. Most of what God has asked you to do is not going to feel spiritual. We got to just get, we got to get, we just got to get okay with that. There is just a lie in the church that says what, you ha- what you're doing has to feel spiritual. It has to feel valuable. It has to feel, <gasps> well, the reality is, is that I did that for a while, and it was exhausting because you have to go to a lot of different places, read a lot of different books, have a lot of people pray over you to get that feeling continuing to go. And it's just not life. I can't drag my, my three and a half kids with me everywhere just so I can continue to have that experience of <gasps> feeling spiritual. And there's a point when I had to just say, God, this is what you've asked me to do. Making dinner is spiritual. It's the right thing. It's the holy thing. It's what God asked me to do, and it's the right thing. I'm serving what's in front of me, and I'm doing it well. Some of you men, God's saying, go to work, and you're going, but that isn't, I'm not doing what I want. Exa-. God goes, just do it. Go to work. Put a smile on your face and do it well. You go, well, I, I just feel like, I mean, shouldn't it be my passion and my work ethic and all of it combined? I mean, I should be living the dream. No, no, listen, we're on earth. There are things. Do you think every mom feels like they're living the dream? 
Di changing diapers is not living the dream, let me tell you. <laughs> it's living somebody's nightmare. No, I'm kidding, but you know. We got to get over this part of us, this anxiety of it's got to be this, and it's got to be that, and it's got to feel, and oh. Listen, what God's expecting you to do is get really good at the things he's asked you to, to be steady in the midst of it. And not to check out in the midst of the mundane. Part of being spiritual and having leadership in your life is doing the mundane well. Keeping your heart alive in the midst of that. You know, you think, I, it's not easy for me to keep my heart alive. I would love nothing more than to just check out. Life is hard. Every morning I get up, there are hungry people in my house. And most of them can't feed themselves. And, and literally, I wake up to cries. Every morning, do you, do you understand? Every morning, I wake up to a cry. It's not an alarm clock. It's not, some of you guys have these beautiful alarm clocks. And your spouse brings you coffee. I have screaming children and they're screaming and I wake up and I got to do life and half the time you know I'm, I'm getting you know oh okay you wet the bed again awesome and and all these things that I'm you know and I'm doing all this stuff and it doesn't feel spiritual it doesn't feel righteous and then I, but in the midst of it I'm going God keep my heart alive I don't want to check out I don't want to medicate myself I don't want to just put my kids in front of the tv and get on the computer and because that's what I want to do I just want to I want to just check out and like look at people's clean homes for a living you know <laughs> And I, I just want to watch the Food Network because there's something about watching the Food Network that makes me feel like I'm doing something. I don't know why, but it feels like I'm doing something. It's satisfying. Watching other people work hard is very fulfilling, isn't it? Feels, that feels spiritual. No. But at the end of the day, what we do, if we do it right and with the right heart, God can interrupt any part of your program to give you what you need. I had to learn this. This took me years to get. I want you to hear me. God can interrupt any part of your life at any moment to give you what you need. He doesn't operate on anxiety. He doesn't operate on, uh-oh, well, they, they showed up three times. Now I got to give them what they need. No, 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 no. God, God, I mean, many times I have, let me tell you, I'm telling you in, in vulnerability, I have had anxiety where I've gotten my entire family dressed, ready. We showed up at church eight times. We're all there and God doesn't do anything. The next Monday morning, I've got my coffee, right? My hair's a mess, makeup on my face, my kids are running around. And all of a sudden God says something to my heart and it was the thing I needed to hear. And I had drug everybody everywhere else to get somewhere where I just needed the feeling of trying. And I was addicted to the feeling of trying versus just saying, I'm going to trust you, God, that you can meet me. And so part of being steady is learning to be permanently planted in what God's asked you to do. It's always going to feel hard in certain things. It's called being a grown-up. Being responsible, oh, that sounds horrible. Ugh. God's not going to give you things and entrust you with things if you're going to be an adolescent. Why would God give me souls and give me people to reach if I just always want to play and hang out and never do anything, and then when I feel like it, show up? God's not going to entrust me with great things until I learn to be diligent with the things that he's asked me to be diligent with. Are you being diligent with your health? Are you, it's God, it's God nailing you about things that you're taking care of. Are you getting a good night's sleep? Are you, are you, are you being kind to your body? I mean, there was a time when I felt like if I didn't have a quiet time, then I wasn't holy. And so I'll stay up to 1 a.m. And, and then I'll get all wound up. But you know what? I did the holy thing. I did a quiet time. Yeah, but you were a mess the rest of the day because you were so tired. I know that sounds really unspiritual, but I, I'm telling you, there's a point when we have to say, God, Teach me what it means to be permanently planted. There is no rush in you. <laughs> there is no rush in you, God. I'm in it for the long haul. I'm doing this for a long time. Teach me how to sustain myself in the midst of this. I, I'm not trying to get my kids raised so I can serve you well. We talked about this a little bit. It's called spiritual idealism, and it will rob from us. There was a point when Ben and I, after our, our third child, we realized life wasn't going to slow down. 
it takes a while as a parent to realize those things, you know, like this isn't working. And we both repented. I remember him and I both getting on our knees before God and saying, we're sorry for being spiritual idealistic. We were sorry for pushing everything aside and thinking, well, one day we're really going to go hard after God. We're really going to pray together. We're really going to, and just saying, even if it's five minutes, it's five minutes worth. It was valuable. Some of you go, I need, a, I need an hour quiet time. No, put some praise music on the way to work and worship with your whole heart. It will be worth it. Don't you think the enemy would love nothing more than to wear you out with the ideal? You don't think I've spent 30 minutes of worship trying to get everything perfect so I can worship right? There's a point when I just finally said, I, this is exhausting. I'm not going to sit and repent for 30 minutes every time I get into a worship service. I, I'm sorry. That's not what we're doing here. Lord, I'm sorry. You love me. Forgive me. Let's do what we're here to do. That's called being steady. It's called being steady. It also means immovable means firmly persistent, rock solid, tougher than your problems, firmly persistent. I think about two scriptures in the Bible. I think about the Israelites when they were given their promised land. You know what Jesus, you know, I'm sorry, you know what God, God the Father asked them to do? He asked them to go around Jericho over and over and over, not to fight, but to be consistent. I would, I would suggest this. Most of the victory you're looking for is going to be found in persistence and consistency. Most of your breakthroughs are going to happen in the mundane. We talked about this a little bit. The woman at the well doing her daily duties, and Jesus interrupts this program to get to her. Most of us in our lives, when we're doing the thing we're called to be doing, listen, David was delivering food to his brothers when God interrupted the program to change his life forever. Just delivering food, being consistent, being faithful. being consistently faithful. I think about Nahum when he was sick in 2 Kings and it talks about how he had all these, this, these boils and leprosy all over him and he has this maid servant that's living in his home and, and she says to him, you've got to go to Elisha. He's, he's a prophet. He can heal you. And so he, get, he gets all of his army and he goes and he runs to this house and before he can get to the house, Elisha sends a servant and he says, tell him to go into the river and dip seven times and he'll be cleansed. You know what Nam does? He, he gets really mad. He's like, if he can't come and tell me what to do, he sends a little servant to come and tell me, I'm not doing it. Some of us don't like how it comes, we don't, so we don't obey. Because we don't like that person, so why would we want to hear it from them? You know, we don't like that, so why would we? And sometimes... God's checking our motives of what we're really going to hear him in. And so he says, I'm not, not going to do that. And then, then the servants begin to tell him, well, whoa, 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 just a minute. If, if he tells you to, why not just try it? Just like go, just go to the river and dunk seven times and let's just see. And I can imagine this, this great, I mean, powerful man. He, he goes to this river and, and he goes to dunk. And I could say, have you ever done what God's asked you to do with a bad attitude? <laughs> you ever done that? It's like, God goes, okay, well, I want you to show up. You go, I'll show up. That's fine. I'll be there. Well, this isn't touching my heart. I'm not really liking this, but I'll do it. You know, I don't, I'll give. I'll give that. That's fine. You know, if you just want my money, fine, God, you can have it. You know, we have these attitudes about things he's asking us to do. I can see this big man, you know, with this leprosy, and he's embarrassed, and he's embarrassed. He can't solve this. He's a strong man. He's used to making things work. Men look to him for answers. They look to him for leadership, and this man can't change what's going on on the inside, and he doesn't know what to do, and it's humiliating, and it's embarrassing, and he does, he's stuck. So he goes under the water and he comes back up and nothing's changed. How many of you have obeyed God once and been frustrated because nothing changes? It's like all of us women who have prayed for our husbands for like one day. 
you know, I'll just pray for him. God, I prayed, and he still came home, and he did that same thing. Or some of us have prayed for our bosses. I'm going to be nice, and I'm going to go in. And the boss is like, where were you? You're late. You know, you're like, I tried to believe you, God. I worshiped all the way to work, and he's still a jerk. You know, I don't understand. And God goes, no, I want you to go back and do the same thing. And part of that is that it takes humility to obey in the midst of feeling like the wind is taken out of us. It takes humility to say, I'm going to do it again. So he goes back under. And he does it over and over and over. You see, some of us, I think we give up on number six. I do. I think there are part of us that we've tried, we've done it, we've prayed, we've sang, we've done everything. And then we just give up. And God said, did you obey? Listen, your breakthroughs and the 100% obedience, it's not in you just obeying. It's in you having a heart to do exactly what I asked you to do. Some of us, God says, I want you to go talk to that person. And then we, we jump to it. You know, we're in, the, we're in the parking lot. We're on the phone. We're talking. To, and we don't understand why did it not go as we thought. And God goes, because I didn't ask you to do that. You added to what I asked you to do. And the reason we add many times is because of anxiety or frustration. We, we want to fix it. And part of being immovable is getting the order and then doing it well. And then getting the next order and doing it well. And then something happens and we don't expect it. And we can't believe that our kid would do that. And God goes, okay, tell me what you think. Cry out to me. Say that one thing to your child. And then leave it alone. And we get on the phone and we go, okay, this is it. And we bite our tongue and we, we were quiet, and then we wait. I've done this with my spouse. I, I know what that's like. There are things in our marriage, something happens in our relationship, and all of a sudden, I, I have, I'm ready to just, let's talk about this, and let's go to war over this, and God goes, just be quiet. I want you to say this one thing, because I've, I've covered nagging women in the Bible, remember? I go, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. And God goes, okay, just say it once. Don't be a drippy faucet. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So I'll say it once, and then he says, be quiet. Now, have I, how many of you have ever just jumped in? Let me just tell you a little bit. It seems like there's an open door. Come on. And then all of a sudden, but when I wait, and then I go back and I begin to pray, God, do it. Do it right now. Lord, we, I ask you for breakthrough right in this moment. I, I know I've said it once. You asked me to say it once, and that's it. And I'm just going to say it. Then God begins to do something. And it's about him showing us how to be steady in the midst, being fully obedient being fully obedient. Lastly, I want to talk about exposing our giants, exposing the things that are in our land and that keep us movable. And one of those is I want to talk about when the Israelites came into the land, they had all kinds of giants that were facing them. And each of the tribes of the giants represented something, what their names meant and what comes against us. When the, when the Israelites went to take their land, one of the giants that lived in that land was the, the Hittite. And the Hittite means simply to beat down. And some of us in our unmovable experience, immovable, excuse me, immovable experiences of our lives, we find that we get beat down a lot. Discouragement happens, failure happens, things happen to us. And we find that when we get shaken, we feel like we're getting beat up. And I think about Deuteronomy 31.8 when it says, The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. And some of us, when, we get, when things happen we weren't expecting or we find ourselves being shaken, it's, we get discouraged. And I, I, I once... I've thought about this, and that is we can be discouraged, but then we can also have a spirit of discouragement on us. And what I mean by that is you can be discouraged. Things happen, and you experience that. But if you, I mean, when things linger on and on and on and on, and pretty soon you're under it, I would have to ask you, maybe you've allowed something under where you begin to live with this Hittite in your land. And you have to say, I am not going to live with this anymore. I'm not going to be discouraged. Help me, God. Lead me to a rock that's higher than I. Take me out of this place of discouragement. Most of the time, I think I fight discouragement after a really high time. You ever have that? Where something great happens, and then the next minute, it's like, oh, I don't know why, but I'm feeling discouraged. 
And many times the Lord wants to show me that the enemy is coming in to steal from me what just happened and to be aware of that. Secondly, there's the enemy of condemnation that comes and, can, and lives in our land, and it's the Amorite, and that's spoken against. It means spoken against, and I think about Romans 8, 1 through 3. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. One of the ways the enemy uses the enemy of condemnation comes at us is that he reminds us of how unworthy and unrighteous and all the things we've done wrong, and he uses it over and over and over against us. And God is not afraid of our failure, but we have to be honest about our failure. And then when our, we're honest about it, he shows us a way out. But a lot of us like to pay penance for our sin. And you know what? The enemy would love nothing more than you to pay penance for your sin. He would love to t- remind you of all the things you should have done, could have done, would have done if you had just done it right. And he'll remind you of it over and over and over. And we've got to kick that enemy out of our land. We've got to say, no, I'm not living with condemnation because there's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. And I'm in him and I'm going to live free. Thirdly is this, there's the enemy of failure. It's the Canaanites and that, that means defeated. And I think about the reality that many of us have done certain things and it didn't work out like we were hoping it would. I remember there was a season in my life where I was really hoping something would work out. And I put all my eggs in one basket. Have you ever done that in your life? You were hoping that this certain thing would happen. And I remember feeling like this is going to happen. It's going to be great. And then there's nothing I could do because I couldn't control any of the players in the story. I realized that it wasn't going to happen. And I remember feeling that sense of, uh uh-oh, I don't know what to do. And then there's nothing worse than feeling defeated. There's nothing worse than feeling like you tried all you could and you still lost. And I think about that reality in our lives. Sometimes in the midst of it, we're going to have things that are going to come against us. And I go back to the treadmill and I think about us being steady before God. And we're going, I want to be found steady. I want to be found faithful. And we're walking before him and we're doing the same thing over and over and over. And in the midst of doing the same thing over and over, we're going to have things that are going to come at us like depression and discouragement and anxiety and lies and condemnation and disappointments and rejection and all those things that touch us. But in the midst of it, God is saying, I want to teach you to be steady and consistent in what I've asked you to do. Be obedient, fully obedient in what I've asked you. And in the midst of that, you will become immovable. I can't help but think about what a community of believers could do for Christ if we were immovable. I can't think about I can, I can think about how if we weren't just taken out every week because something or this or that, but we just said, I'm going to set my face to seek you, God, and be who I'm called to be, and I'm not moving from here. And whatever comes against me, I'm going to trust you in this. I'm going to learn to lean on you. I'm going to find out what's really going on, and I'm going to get back to the place you asked me to be and do it well. That is what keeps us to becoming immovable. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your presence that's in the room even now. And Lord, you're setting us free. I I see those of us in the room that are getting it. They're going, oh, I didn't know that was spiritual. Oh, I didn't know that's what you meant by immovable. Oh, I I didn't know that I've been, that being persistent and consistent is a godly trait like you're talking about. And I would just say, Lord, open up our eyes to see the thing that you've asked us to do. God, show us what's in front of us. Show us the thing, Lord, that you want us. Lord, there's, there's sometimes there's habits in our lives where we're so, we're shaken by things and we don't like it and we know it's true. We know we're caught off guard by it. But I'm asking God, would you keep us steady? In the midst of the storm, God, would you keep us steady and obedient to what you've asked us to Lord, we as women have heard a lot of words this in the last 24, 48 hours, God. There's been a lot that's been that's come at us. But I'm asking, Lord, that in the midst of all of it, we would learn to rise tomorrow with an attitude that's set for you, God. We want to be steady. We want to be faithful. 
And I ask that you would teach us what it is to be mature in you, God, to grow in you. We ask you for grace.